Now here's another proviso of whether or not you actually are saved. Some things people demand, but are not across the board in all the salvation passages. So we have to consider all of these things carefully. For example, according to the passage that begins with John chapter 1 and crescendos with John 3:15 to 36, to believe, literally, whosoever is the believing one, in John 3:16, a moment of faith alone in God's one and only Son alone, who is God, the Word, the Light, the Life, become man, who was given for the world, mankind by God his Father, in order to propitiate the sins of all mankind, in order for each man to choose to believe, as he so will, in so as to have eternal life, as a result of knowing this through a proper reading of Scripture. It is made clear that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is more than mere man. He is God, the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of Man, who, etc., and it is He who is human who actually paid for the sins of all mankind, <clears throat> taking upon himself mankind's eternal condemnation forever, a task that only God has the capacity to perform. Yet the form of man is in the form of man. Hence, corroboration of the deity of Christ, Jesus the man, and his propitiation for mankind's sins throughout Scripture is essential in order to convey an actual trustworthy salvation unto eternal life that has actually occurred in history hence trustworthy, because he is trustworthy, because the testimony of Scripture about him is evidently true and trustworthy. So without a true and trustworthy testimony about this actual historical event, that he is God and man, who propitiated the son's sins of all mankind, without that there is no salvation unto eternal life. <clears throat> you can have a somewhat of a, a an idea of this, deny all the essential points that I just mentioned and then that dismantles the entire thing from actually being real, true, actual action. Excerpt from the study of the current content of saving faith. The content of what one must do for salvation unto eternal life does not require knowledge of or believe in non-essential for salvation unto eternal life doctrines of the faith such as the deity of Christ, Trinity, unlimited atonement, unconditional election, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and so on. These things are extremely important, but they're not essential to the one thing that would provide for you eternal life. On the other hand, <clears throat> this is the peculiarity of it, <clears throat> certain non-essential to salvation beliefs, which are excluded, doctrines which are excluded from the required saving content, such as the deity of Christ, his resurrection, the Trinity, one God, or that no kind of faithfulness is required in order to be, be or stay saved, etc., must be not be believed, disbelieved at the time that saving faith is expressed, which disbelief would negate being saved at all. Albeit a born-again believer might later fall into such apostasy, yet still remain saved. Sounds like double talk, but it's just a matter of pure logic. To believe unto eternal life that God has made provision for one's sins through his one and only Son includes, implies, believing in Jesus Christ's sacrifice, propitiation, provision for the ones for one's sins, that he, Jesus Christ, indeed has the capacity and willingness to make that provision. Hence, it can only be true that he is therefore God, only God can do this, whether or not one knows, believes in this even at the time one expresses saving faith. The successful outcome of the salvation unto eternal life, however, is not dependent upon knowing or believing in any non-essential to salvation unto eternal life doctrines. The essential content of what one must believe in order to have eternal life is present in every single salvation unto eternal life passage without the need to add or take away anything in that passage. Note that passages that do not in indicate that eternal life is in view, omitting such words as have eternal life, justified, and so on, when the context means to be credited with the righteousness of God, Jesus Christ, or words to the effect of receiving everlasting residence in the eternal kingdom of God. Saved when the content 
when the context indicates a one-time reception of eternal life, as opposed to harvesting a more abundant eternal life by works in order to add to an already received one one time reception of eternal residence, life in the eternal kingdom of God. So you get rewarded in heaven, but you get there. Now you get additional rewards in heaven that doesn't uh, secure the eternal destiny so far as getting into residency, but it will add to it later on. So it's not essential. And as opposed to the pres preservation of the value or length of one's temporal life. So you have a longer temporal life, shorter one, but your destiny and evidence establishes that moment of faith alone in Christ alone. It all depends upon context, context, and context. Nevertheless, many of Scripture is not essential to, but interdependent with being saved unto eternal life doctrines are irretrievably, inseparably related to the essential to salvation doctrines in the sense that they all have to be true for any of them to be true. Although one does not have to know of or believe in these non-essential but two but interdependent with salvation unto eternal life doctrines, along with those essential doctrines that give one eternal life at that time, they believe and were saved unto eternal life. Nevertheless, at that moment, when one does become saved unto eternal life, one cannot be denying the truth of any of the non-essential two but interdependent with being saved unto eternal life doctrines. It's tricky. For then, there is no salvation unto eternal life received at all. For example, you don't believe in the deity of Christ. Well, the only one that can provide salvation for the, uh, the whole of humanity would have to be one who has the capacity of God and God alone. So if you don't believe he is God, you don't get eternal life. For given the time one needs to spend properly studying and learning scripture, one might not yet have a knowledge of or belief in a number of not essential to, but interdependent with being saved unto eternal life doctrines up to the time when it was saved unto eternal life, or even thereafter. Most Christians are not good students of scripture. But the content of the original belief which results in eternal life cannot include disbelief in any of the non-essential to, but interdependent with being saved unto eternal life doctrines, such as belief that Jesus was only human, or less than God, i.e. a God, or that there is more than one God, or that the Trinity is a false doctrine, or that Jesus was never raised from the dead, or a belief that something else besides a moment of faith alone in Christ alone for forgiveness of sins needs to be done, such as to repent of all of one's sins or to persevere in good works, or to demonstrate one's faith via some kind of human doing. For to insist on human doing, or to believe in a human being, or a created God to provide eternal life through a self-sacrifice for the sins of the whole world would not provide eternal life at all. On the other hand, if one was who has expressed faith in the essential doctrines of the faith in order to have eternal life without denying any doctrine that would negate receiving eternal life at that moment of faith alone, and therefore denies any of the doctrines of the faith, especially those essential to salvation and to eternal life, one nevertheless remains saved, albeit an apostate, until one repents from such apostasy and under God's discipline, which might result in an early physical death and or a great loss of eternal reward for the rest of eternity, but never loss of eternal life. Relative to the essential doctrines of Scripture, an individual needs to properly respond to in order to have eternal life. Logic demands that the least common denominator of stipulations which complete salvation unto eternal life passages contain in order to have eternal life is wholly sufficient in order to receive eternal life. In order to determine what the least common denominator of these stipulations is, one must review clear salvation passages and then compare them to the more difficult passages to arrive at those stipulations which are common to all of them. Nothing else in any salvation unto eternal life passage or any passage in Scripture needs to be responded to in order to have eternal life. Doctrines may not be denied, disbelieved, 
at the point of exercising faith in Christ for salvation unto eternal life. Otherwise, salvation is not received at that point at all. So all such complete salvation passages, those that declare one to have eternal life once, what is stipulated within them is obeyed in the sense of believed in, all have in common a common moment of faith alone in a provision made for forgiveness, payment for one's sins resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, or an equivalent name or person for him, which implies residence in the eternal kingdom of God, i.e. heaven. This is the least common denominator of passages which provides directions for one to follow in order to have eternal life. In the sense of expressing a moment of faith alone in those essential doctrines. So, after stipulations which are in view, in addition to the least common denominator of stipulations for eternal life, in any salvation passage, or in any other passage which are not essential for eternal life when accepted by a moment of faith alone, do not serve to provide eternal life. But they certainly are valuable when obeyed, in the sense of for the personal growth and understanding of the born-again believer for blessing and eternal rewards. Upon careful examination, in accordance with the normative rules of language, context, and logic, certain stipulations in complete salvation passages of language, context, and logic, certain stipulations in complete salvation passages often say precisely the same, in other words, as our other stipulations in other complete salvation passages do, which are thus essential and part of the least common denominator, only sufficient for one to respond to by a moment of faith alone unto eternal life. For example, God gave his one only Son. In John 3.16 is tantamount to saying, the Christ, in 1 John 5.1, and John 20.31 as clearly defined from Scripture. There are several ways of saying the same thing in different words. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one only Son, that whoever believes, literally is the believing one in him, should not perish, but should have eternal life. And you look at 1 John 5.1, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. And compare John 20.31, But these words have been written so that you may, not, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So fully defining the phrase rendered the Christ is not something one would expect an unbeliever or a newborn believer would be very knowledgeable of, albeit scriptures indicate that he is the one who made provision for one's sins. Consider what little information Abraham received from God, far less than the epistles provide for us today. And he was declared righteous unto eternal life when he believed in that information. For the term righteousness implies forgiveness of sins, for Abraham was was not without sin. Hence, the information in Genesis 15, 6 includes the stipulation that that forgiveness is under unto eternal life through a descendant of Abraham in order to enjoy the blessing and knowing of experiencing innumerable descendants in the eternal kingdom of God through Abraham's seed, descendant, Jesus Christ, in the sense of a being of propitiation for Abraham's sins. Here we take a look at this. Romans 4, 24 Therefore it was reckoned to him as righteousness, Abraham, and not now not for his sake only, for it was written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also, to whom it was ra will be reckoned, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So if we follow the same pattern that Abraham did, we don't need any additional information. We need all of it, but nothing additional. Notice that additional information beyond what the Old Testament scriptures indicate was revealed by God to Abraham relative to justification and to eternal life. is stipulated here by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Roman believers, namely that our Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead because of our justification. Since justification unto eternal life is repeatedly stipulated in this chapter in Genesis and elsewhere as we see when one believes what Abraham believed as recorded in Old Testament scripture for those to believe and be justified as well as in the New Testament 
and an understanding and belief are the same in our Lord's resurrection.